In the last month, I've seen two movies in theaters, The Pope's Exorcist and the Super Mario Brothers movie. And I liked the Mario movie. It was fun. It was fine. The Pope's Exorcist, not so fun, not so fine. Let's start negative. I say this respectfully concerning Exorcist movies. Does anybody f***ing care anymore? I don't think the exorcism tag is a hot commodity like it used to be. So I immediately thought the worst when I first saw this trailer. And speaking of the trailer, there was one thing that stuck out to me in the marketing of this movie. And it was this critic quote that they kept stapling to their forehead. Critics are calling it The Exorcist Meets The Da Vinci Code. And I've got a bit of a bold claim in return. I don't think that guy watched the movie. Now I know those critics are calling it Rosemary's Baby meets the Avengers things should be taken like with the loosest definition of those movies. But I can't lie to you. That's pretty much the entire reason why I went to go watch that movie because that quote bothered me. I just kept stewing about it in my brain thinking, I know the only reason he said The Exorcist is solely for the fact that there's an exorcist in that movie. But I was wrong. In fact, it's much worse. I will get there soon. Save your money, get some Raycons, boo. At the price of all those other fools, it's true. Buy now, pay late is an option, too. Quality sound over 50,000 reviews. Five stars, I got with Majin Boo. Noise isolation, I'm not fucking with you. Resistant to dumbbells need decibels. I'm just trying to look edible, baby. Incredible eight hours playtime every day. Earbuds, who put them on, dog? Every day, earbud. Break out as a sponsor. Had to get them their plug. Getting work done while I jam when I wear one. Link below, but I need to beat the slow before the beat is over so I can tell you to go to buyraycon.com slash Mr. Gigi to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. That is buyraycon.com slash Mr. Gigi. And thank you, Raycon, for sponsoring this video. This movie felt incredibly formulaic. Like we start with a spicy exorcism scene to get our balls a little wet, right? And then when that's done, we cut to the title screen and then we get a drone shot of waves crashing with this cool, happy summer song. And oh, it's a single mom driving a dinky car with her two kids. And oh, her daughter's rebellious with an attitude. And oh, the son is quiet and reserved. And oh, they inherited the property that has a secret on it that will slowly begin to affect their lives. Like I'm asking again, does anybody fucking care anymore? I will say, I'm very jaded when it comes to horror movies nowadays. And also, if you watch the channel, I have delved deep into Exorcist 1 and Exorcist 3 lore. And unfortunately, uh, some of Exorcist 2. So when I'm trying to watch playoff games and enjoy my life, and I keep getting hit with this trailer saying, critics are calling it The Omen meets National Treasure. Like that was the pairing, basically. I wanna be proven right about all my cynical thoughts. So I'm walking in that theater and I'm sitting down with my arms crossed like a toddler. Show me what you got, Pope's Exorcist. Now, the entire time that I was watching this movie, I kept having the feeling of this movie being outdated. Like I was watching a movie that should have been released eight years ago. And after looking into it, I guess production had actually started in 2020, so eh. And although I did not particularly like this movie, there is one saving grace in this film that separates it from a lot of the poop drivel horror movies that you see in theaters, and that is Russell Crowe. He plays the Pope's Exorcist. And had they not cast Gladiator, this movie would have stunk out the room. There is not one good scene where he's not involved. He even got some chuckles and smirks out of me. He's playing this serious, badass chief exorcist who also has randomly stupid, drunky humor. He is the only reason that I did not hate myself leaving that theater. He is the only reason that I am not shoving my entire ball sack in this movie's mouth. Now it's more so like I'm hitting this movie with like the, the Wesley Snipes meme where I'm like, ah, I gotta do it, but like, ah, fuck. Russell. Let's quickly set up this movie. Now the first thing I'm greeted with in this movie is a quote from Father Amorth, a real life exorcist in Italy who passed away in 2016. This movie is based on his memoirs. Now what I didn't expect was to immediately recognize that name. And it wasn't because I've been brushing up on my exorcist in Italy, but I knew Father Amorth from a fucking JonTron video. He covered the documentary, The Devil and Father of Morth, made by William Friedkin, the director 
of the original Exorcist. Run and run we go, Jack. John obviously poops all over that documentary. Great video. Darcy, no, you do not shit on my new rug. But that was my introduction to this film, saying, oh, it's about the, got it. Now we see Father Morth, Gabriel, pull up to an exorcism case in a small village. And this is where we get a crash course on his charisma and how he just straight up just bullies demons. Brings a little pig into the room and then he just starts this pissing contest with the demon. He's calling him out, just saying, you know, if you were really like a, like a demon demon, like for real, for real, you could probably possess this pig pretty easily, huh? And the demon reasoning with him. Oh yes, I totally could do that. That's my demon impression. He just keeps shit on him. He's like, ah, you're probably just like a grumpy spirit or something. Possess the pig. And the demon showing him who's boss. Says, all right, I'll show you priest. And then he does it. And then Father Morph says, kill the pig. <laughs> and the day is saved. Also, Lunch? Flash forward to, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't dare call them our main characters. Flash forward to these broomsticks with lines. I'm not even shitty on their acting. The script just, not, just does not care about them in the slightest. This is all about Gabriel and his Robin that we'll meet a little bit later. So we got a single mom who lost her husband. And for some reason, her husband left them a fucking Abbey. I guess I missed why he had that. They don't have any money. So her plan is to go move into the Abbey, fix up the Abbey, and then sell the Abbey to have money. And like, this part doesn't matter. Like, they just need to start the story. But I just kept thinking, I was like, if you can fix up the Abbey and pay this crew, just get an apartment. Keep in mind, they already lived in the States and are now picking up and leaving to Spain to live in a fucking Abbey. How moving out of the country to house yourself in a beat down church that will require repairs is somehow the most logical budgetary move to do here is beyond me. But here we are in Spain, got the whole family. Woo, dead dad. Thanks, James. I don't, I don't know if they said his name. The daughter, Amy, has not too many positive things to say about the church that they will now be living in. And you know what? I don't fucking blame her. I was half expecting to see a typewriter at the entrance for Leon. She talks shit, hates her mom, smokes cigarettes, sits on the handrail because she's dangerous, calls her brother a twerp, which I initially thought, out of touch writers? Twerp? The well, last piece of media I, I've heard twerp in, his fairy odd parents. But then I gave it some lenience because, you know, this movie is supposed to be set in the 80s. And I will quickly follow up that statement by saying, I don't know if they said twerp in the 80s like that. And also maybe that's kind of dumb lenience on my end because none of the other dialogue really seems to take that into account. No one says 80s shit. Put 80s shit on screen right here. I don't know what they said. <laughs> uh, and the son Henry? There's nothing. So real quick, we have a very predictable fake out jump scare to start us off here. Like the sister's brushing her teeth or something. And then the brother knocks on the wall to have her finish that sequence. Like it's like a Nardwar do 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 type thing. And I immediately thought, oh, I can't wait to see that come up again, except in a much more ominous setting. There are many a cliches in this movie. Many. A lot. While Henry roams around the Abbey, he sees a sizable crack in the wall. And if you look in there, you can make out another wall with a, with a marking on it. Keep in mind, since they have arrived, there is an entire crew of people working to fix up this Abbey. But later on in the movie, two workers will be walking by the sizable crack that I mentioned and be surprised that it's there. They say, oh, huh? What the heck? Jimmy, did you miss this one? Uh, sorry, they're in Spain. Pablo, did you miss this one? Yeah, must have. This crew sucks. We see Russell Crowe on a Vespa a couple of times, and uh, it's a really peaceful intermission. It's like watching a golden retriever swim in a lake. It's nice. So Father Morth is brought before the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, or T-C-O-T-D-O-T-F for short. He's summoned because he performed that exorcism in the beginning without a green light from the Vatican. He says a bunch of cool guy shit, but they tell him that they are vacating the chief exorcist position. And then he tells them to just suck toes because if they really want to talk turkey, they can talk to his boss. And his boss is the Pope. And the Pope is on Gabriel's side because he very much believes in the need for an exorcist. By the way, in the movie, Gabriel does this little gesture where he goes, cuckoo. And I'm kind of upset that the movie doesn't tell you why he does that. And by the way, the only reason how I know why he does it is because of the JonTron video. Before any exorcism, Father Morth likes to begin by taunting the devil, just hitting them with a little bro right before they even start. So he just turns to this person who's been suffering in pain, possibly under possession, causing a whole heap of havoc, looks them dead in their shit, cuckoo. 
get fucked even. So like I said, these workers find the hole, right? And they don't have a great look at what's inside. So one of the workers, this survival man, decides to light a flare so he can have a great look in here. Now I'm sure the sparks or just his hand obstruction will, will, will not interfere with what he's trying to see over there. But anyways, he sticks his hand in and then the place explodes. Kind of deserved. And it's at this point that I started to realize, holy shit, they are zooming through this movie. We do not take many breaks, especially past this point. Like right after the explosion, they cut to an ambulance. He's being thrown on a stretcher and the leader of the guys is like, we can't work here anymore. Fucking bye, come on boys. Then they show you the hole again and they go, you hear a rah. And then all of a sudden the sun's convulsing. They're like, what's going on? And then he says some scary shit. He's like, you're all gonna die. And then just digs into his face. Boom, cat scan. Doctors saying, there's not much we can do. What, what do you mean? He's just a boy. Then Henry starts feeling up his mom and she's like, stop. Then he does it again and she's like, seriously, chill the fuck out. And then after doing it some more, he says, I quote, it's with a little rasp in his voice too, just keep that in mind. This baby's hungry, you fat cow. It's a little break in between that. You never breastfed me, mommy. And this scene was a bit of a double whammy for me, right? Because he said the lines and I thought, hmm. And then he lifts up his shirt and ingrained into his stomach is the word hate. And I thought, hmm. Now I think we all know the saying, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but is it? Is it? This movie, I would guess, in their eyes, kind of pays homage to The Exorcist. Because it was hard for me to watch certain moments and just brush it off as, oh, that's just a cliche in an Exorcist movie. Instead of being like, oh, that's The Exorcist. Like Henry pulling up his shirt to reveal the word hate ingrained on his stomach. Sure, that happened in The Exorcist. But it's also just really fucking dumb. In The Exorcist, Reagan had the words help me appear on her stomach, and that is because it is Reagan herself pleading for help in a body that is no longer hers. Now they didn't have to make the same point, but what kind of corny ass demon is this? Like this is supposed to be one of the 200 fallen angels on earth, possessing an innocent child, trying to infiltrate the Vatican and raise an army of demons. Now later in the movie, the Pope is in the hospital because of, of demons. I'm not joking, that's basically why. And while he's there, he projectile vomits blood onto another holy man, which looks terrible. It isn't shocking, it isn't scary, and it's actually passed over pretty quick because it doesn't look good. So why include it? Cause exorcist, were you baiting out that critic to put that stupid fucking comparison in? And of course there's a head turn moment, but I've seen this one used way more across the horror genre. So I'll give it a pass here. Now this movie does confuse me a bit because it is taking itself seriously about 85% of the time. And I kept struggling to discern the intentional comedy and the bad writing, like the boob scene with Henry Fonda over here. Henry Fonda used to be an actor and the kid's name is also Henry. It's really good wordplay. Like, I think that was just bad writing because possession demons can be very childish in their insults and they can often be crude. Like in The Exorcist, Possess Reagan tells Father Karras, Your mother sucks cocks in hell, Karras. Which is both of those things. But it's also super fucked up because Karras's mom dies in the movie and he feels really guilty about it. And he's also a man who's struggling with his faith when a demon, who if anybody knows what's going on down there, is telling him, Yo, come get your girl. <laughs> also, yes, I know, stop comparing it to The Exorcist. That was my last comparison. So in that same vein, the next scene is supposed to be funny, which it wasn't bad at all. Evil Henry says, Bring me the priest. And just so you know, there is a priest already at the Abbey that is helping out the family, Father Escabel. So he calmly, you know, goes into the kid's room, opens the door, and then he gets fucking catapulted out, smacked into a mirror. And then Henry yells, Wrong fucking priest. <laughs> he roars a lot in this movie. I'll pick up the pace a bit from here. So this small town little Abbey discrepancy somehow makes its way straight to the fucking Pope. So then the Pope tells Gabriel to get on it. And by it, I mean the Vespa. He meets with Henry, the demon, and quickly realizes, oh, you're built different. Because the demon knows enough about Gabriel to throw him for that interaction. And also, bonus content, here's some more bad lines from Henry. So Gabriel's asking for his name in this scene, and then Henry says, quote, My name is blasphemy. My name is nightmare. Which was like supposed to be an impactful moment. Be like, nightmare, I don't like those things. But it kind of just reminded me of this. I am the nightmare. So we have a few questions answered at this point. Like, why was the boy possessed? And the answer is, 
Trauma. The answer is always trauma. See, Henry's dad that died, he died in a car accident. And Henry was in the car when that happened, so then he saw him impaled and dead. And he just hasn't been the same. And apparently, trauma can be a gateway for the devil. Which, isn't that great? Oh, your family was murdered in front of you? I mean... Well, it can't get much worse from here. Oh my God! Gabriel is also vulnerable here because he has two skeletons, if you will. One, he used to be a soldier and his platoon got shot up right in front of him and he was the only one who survived, so he felt really guilty about it. Two, there was an exorcism case of a girl named Rosaria where Gabriel determined that she was just mentally disturbed, so he passed off the case to someone else and then unfortunately ended up witnessing her jump off like a clock tower to her demise. Turns out she had actually suffered years of sexual abuse within the walls of the church, and he once again felt incredibly guilty for doing nothing about it. Anyways, back to demon stuff. That Nardwar knock I was talking about, that comes back into play ominously. Gabriel then huddles up and he's like, all right, wait, we have to figure out the name of the demon to cast him out. Henry calls Gabe Soldier Boy because he was a soldier as a boy, but my brain didn't hear that. My brain heard what you heard. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Henry tells the priest he's gonna fuck him and that Gabriel's gonna be coming because of the fucking and that he's gonna hate that he is coming. I'm just delivering the news. Father Escobar also gets called out. Like Henry calls him a panty sniffer and he tells him, well, oh, you're too busy fucking the congregation's daughters, which I have yet to find an insult there. And I hate to bring it back to this, but as you should know, critics are calling this the exorcist meets the Da Vinci Code. So we should probably not talk about why that second movie is even in that quote. So Gabriel and Escobel make their way into that secret room that's been hinted at this entire time. Finding documents, catacomb, and the records of that abbey are all redacted, and apparently that has to do with the Spanish Inquisition. So all of the skeletons that are down here in the catacomb are people who would not convert at that time. And all the sealed off gases down there of decomposing bodies and stuff are the reason that the flare blew up. Apparently the church was trying to cover this up because I guess the Spanish Inquisition only began because of a man who was actually possessed getting in powerful people's ears. So all those people who died for not converting was ultimately the work of the devil. The exorcist at the time was also buried down there, but he gets like a cool burial because he was just kind of in a nice chair. Oh. And that sizable crack in the wall that I was talking about, that was made by the construction team, I guess, and that's what freed the demon. So basically, the demon actually possessed Henry to get Gabriel there to possess him to get someone on the inside of the Vatican to raise an army of the fallen angels just like the Da Vinci Code. So they eventually discover the name of the demon. So now it's time to exercise said demon. But first, Gabriel decides he should probably sit down and confess to Father Escabel and talk about Rosaria and the war some more. Meanwhile, upstairs, the mom is no joke being sonic rolled in the air to a mirror and then being choked to death while the daughter is levitating and having her neck snapped. But yeah, it's crazy that like 40 years ago, I almost got shot with my boys. <sighs> Right, dude? Also, Father Escobel has an epiphany at this point, like now in the movie, and says something like, Bring me the priest. It didn't mean me. It meant you. No shit. Was you being bow and arrow into a mirror not evidence of that? Henry literally said, Wrong fucking priest. Ra! So now it's time for the epic showdown, the exorcism. It's rainy and thundery, of course. Henry is trying to use mind tricks on the priest. Then Amy, the daughter, also gets possessed. And it's really funny because she climbs up the wall like Spider-Man and then starts contorting and shit and then just jumps back down. That was pretty cool, right? Yeah, I've been working on that one. Then she tackles her mom through a door and then fucking smacks her head into a sink, breaking the sink. And how that woman is not dead yet is astounding. Gabriel realizes he's losing the fight, so he tells the demon to take me instead, leave them alone. Which two things real quick. I never got the point of them discovering the name of the demon. It was a fairly big point they stuck on and the reveal of the demon's name was like, oh, oh shit, it's Asmodeus. And I kept waiting for Gabriel to say the name in the middle of the exorcism and catch the demon off guard and be like, how did you know? But I don't think anybody ever said his name the entire, either of the fathers. They just were losing the battle. 
nothing changed. Two, this also happened in The Exorcist. I haven't really talked about what's happening with the Pope, by the way. I guess they just needed something else to cut to at this point in the movie. Because I swear, every time it cut back to the Pope, it was like a fucking eight second scene and then back to what was actually happening. So like I said, he's in the hospital because demons. He read a spooky letter and he was like, demons? And then he went to the hospital. And when Gabriel gets overtaken, it cuts to the Pope and it's him in the hospital bed saying, Gabriel, no! And that's about it. That's all I wanted to share. Back to Gabriel. He's possessed, but he's pretty strong. So he's able to fight the guy off a bit. And he's got like semi-control. So he tells Father Escobar to leave with the family. And then he just tries jumping the guardrail to just end this once and for all. But the demon keeps stopping him. And then Gabriel powers through to walk all the way to the catacomb area they were in. All the way to be in front of the, exor the old exorcist because it's symbolic. And then he pulls out his letter and he's like, both of us going to hell. But before he blows everything up, and don't ask me any questions about the following scenes. Before he blows everything up, an angel slowly arises from the ground. But then, uh-oh, it's a bad angel. And then it jump scares us. So after Father Escobar drives the family back to safety, he comes all the way back. Then he sees Gabriel sat in the chair where the other exorcist was, because it's symbolic. But he's like possessed now, for real, for real. So Escobar just starts praying. He's like, come on, Gabriel, I know you're in there. And then Gabriel starts to levitate. And then the demons cast it out. I am not joking. Gabriel's free. Demons like that? Easy pickings. But, 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 but. Now, the demon is sentient, I guess is the word, because it's not banished, but it no longer needs a vessel either, because the demon is still talking to them and then spawns in Rosaria as a demon, which then attacks Gabriel, or is like kind of riding him for a little bit. I don't know what's going on, choking him. And then some naked woman that matters to Escabel spawns in covered in blood, also a demon, and starts attacking him. Are you still with me? So Escabel's on the ground and he grabs his necklace, I think, puts it to her forehead. She swells up, blows up, blood everywhere. He then grabs his cross. It's like when someone's passing the gun to someone in like a gunfight and they fucking pop it up. That's what he's doing, but with a cross. And he grabs a cross and no joke, you hear like a laser wind up sound when he puts it to her forehead. It's like a halo gun. She doesn't even blow up. It's funny. He's like frying her and then just kind of nudges, <laughs> nudges her off into a little pool. Did I mention there's a pool in the catacomb? There's a pool in the catacomb. She falls into the pool, which then turns into a pit of hell. They pull out the crosses and pray her away one last time. Sonic boom, they both fly back. Then the day is saved. Gabriel then finds a flask in his pocket. And he's like, ah, you know the Lord works in very mysterious ways, which I thought was cute. But uh, speaking of shots, can I see you on a Vespa just one more time? <sighs> I needed this. So the Pope is now healthy. There was a change in the congregation, which favors Gabriel. By the way, this is how much the family did not matter at all. Their resolve is just one of the guys just quickly on the move telling us that the family has moved back in the, to the US and they've safely recovered. That's it. Anyways, the end of this movie trips me up. So Gabriel walks into the Vatican's secret library or whatever, and he and Escobel can go in there because they did a really cool thing. And the guy that's there is discussing the 199 other sites where God is not welcomed because the Abbey was just one of them. I felt like I was watching like the end of Rush Hour or Bad Boys or fucking Narcos. What do you know about the Cali Cartel? Gabriel invites Escobar to join him. He accepts and then the movie ends. So I guess it's a setup for a buddy cop exorcist film where they visit godless sites and destroy them, which honestly sounds way fucking cooler than what I saw. I think this film should have just fully leaned into like off the wall. I know it sounds like it did, but because it was still trying to stay leveled and still trying to take itself seriously a lot, but also including dumb shit, it just came off bad. But that sequel sounds cool. Like I'm all for Russell Crowe taking it to demons again. If you're getting rid of Russell, fucking throw it away. Now I don't think this sequel will actually happen, but if they can find the right path, that could be a fun movie. But another problem here is that I feel like it would be shitty of them to turn this series into like a fucking Marvel movie or something when it's based on Father or Morph's life. I don't know what are the rules to shit like that, but I mean, it's already got mixed reactions from people, so I don't know. Just to reiterate my feelings, I would never say this movie is as bad as something like The Nun. I think this movie is years ahead of that joke, but it is incredibly silly and not in the fun way. Hope you paid Russell a fat bag because he earned it. But for now, that is it. To the best, boys.
If you guys enjoyed this movie review, please leave a like. I would very much appreciate that. Subscribe because I'm trying to hit a million in 2023. Here are my lovely patrons. They're great. Maybe it would make more sense to put them over here by the green screen. Either way, they're on screen. Appreciate you guys. Do exclusive videos over there monthly at viz.tv slash MrGG for fucking barware and clothes and stuff like that. If you haven't checked out the second channel, Mr. G-Dubs, there's content there that you haven't seen. And as always, I am Mr. Gigi, and I am out. Ra. Bye.